I will never say that we should be eliminating gifted programs in order to create equity in our schools. What we should do is change the way that we identify students for gifted services, change the way teachers are trained, change the way we collaborate with families and with those parents of those students, change the way we, uh, you know, we do everything in the name of educating our brightest students. They are everywhere. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber. This is the last episode of this season and of 2021, and I'm excited to close out with an incredible guest. I'm talking with Dr. Joy Lawson Davis, an award-winning author, professional learning trainer, independent consultant, and equity activist. Dr. Davis's areas of expertise and focus are culturally responsive teaching, equity and access in gifted education programs, and meeting the needs of diverse gifted learners. Joy is also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Education, Gifted Education, a sought-after keynote speaker and trainer for organizations, school districts, and state agencies across the nation and internationally. She is the author of Bright, Talented, and Black, a guide for families of African-American gifted learners, gifted children of color around the world, diverse needs, exemplary practices, and directions for the future. And during this interview, you'll hear us talk about her recently released books, Empowering Underrepresented Gifted Students, Perspectives from the Field, and Culturally Responsive Teaching in Gifted Education. As you can probably tell, Dr. Davis is a very busy person, and this is a jam-packed conversation with a lot of resources for parents and schools. We talked about special gifts that Black gifted children have that are often missed, the biggest roadblocks in traditional education models for Black gifted students, and how schools can support the Black families in their community and make their programs more inclusive. I also asked Joy her perspective on the very timely issue of racial disparities in public gifted school programs, as well as her ideas for white families who want to join the fight for equity in gifted programs. I hope this conversation leaves you feeling a sense of urgency mixed with a powerful boost of inspiration and motivation. Also, I did take a lot of notes during this episode, and Dr. Davis shared a ton of resources, so I encourage you to visit the show notes page. You'll also find a list of key takeaways, a transcript, and a podcast player with the episode broken down into chapters. So if you want to go back and re-listen to a specific piece of the conversation, you can easily find it. This week's episode can be found at tiltparenting.com slash session 278. A quick reminder that if you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed with changing schedules, family and in-law dynamics, big expectations, and tricky kid energy, and you could use a giant reset button so you can wipe the slate clean and start fresh, check out my new mini course, The Emergency Reset. I created this to help you get out of a negative parent-child cycle and prevent you from getting dragged back into that cycle moving forward. Learn more at tiltparenting.com slash emergency reset. Lastly, as I said at the head of the episode, this is the last new episode for 2021. I'll be back with brand new episodes starting February 1st, 2022. And I've already started interviewing people for the next season. I can tell you right now, it's going to be a good season. I've got episodes coming up with Mona Delahook, with Maria Kennedy, and Louise Lockhart, Natasha Daniels, and much more. I cannot wait to share it with you. And of course, if you miss the show between now and February 1st, I encourage you to go back into the archives and listen or re-listen to some oldies but goodies. I hope you have a restorative, spacious, and beautiful holiday break, whatever you celebrate, however you're spending it, and I can't wait to reconnect with you in the new year. Okay, that's enough out of me. Let's go to my conversation with Dr. Joy Lawson Davis. Hello, Dr. Davis. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning. Yes, we are starting this bright and early on a Friday, which is impressive, I think, for both of us. But I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And so I have read your bio and you have a very distinguished career in this field. But I would love to hear in your words a little bit more about the work that you do in the world and the purpose-driven mission of your work. Well, um, yes, it is a (laughs) purpose-driven mission, uh, I would say, Deb, and I really appreciate you having me today to come and talk a little bit about my work. Um, I've been at this for um, a few decades now, and um, I, I, um, I take it uh, as, as a part of uh, my reason, actually, for even being here, not just here on your podcast, but being in general. Um, I see that there is still so much work to be done in the, in the field of gifted education and general education in terms of equity. And um, because of the ways that I've gone about um, seeking information, because I, I talk to uh, educators, I talk to parents, I conduct my own research, but I also try to document as much as I can so that I can share my work with others through writing. Um, I am. Um, I believe that the, that we have not done well. We have not done well uh, in general ed- in education by students of color, students from um, poverty backgrounds, students who who are twice exceptional, or as we call them now, often thrice exceptional. Those who are culturally diverse and twice exceptional. There are a number of student groups that we have not done well by in the field of education. Uh, As a result, these students remain marginalized. The needs, the the interests of these students and their families are not uh, at the center and the core of what we do as educators. And so I continue with the work I do for that very reason. Um, I know that may sound a little vague, but uh, it is what I do and why. Um, I think that um, I have a... um, I would say, you know, without sounding uh, egotistical, I have a special gift for reaching audiences, and and I use that. I use that every way I can, either through, again, speaking with them, training, uh, writing, um, just uh, having people face themselves and face where they, where they are, what their role is, what kind of biases do we still hold on to that keep uh, children, uh, children of color in particular, from being recognized and being served in what we call gifted education and advanced learner programs in this country. Um, and so, you know, basically that's that's what I do and why I do it. Um, I think as we explore this topic in the next hour, we will uh, get dig a little deeper into some of the outcomes uh, of my work. Thanks, Deb. Thank you for asking that question. No, such a such a great introduction. And obviously your passion comes through and you do have such a gift for this work. And that's the first time I've heard the term thrice exceptional as well. Share with us what you see as some of the unique gifts of Black gifted children. Black gifted children, let's say this, let's start off by saying that, that gifted children share uh, common traits. They're curious, they, they, um, they can you know, master content material in classes and classroom uh, far beyond their age peers. Uh, they're very compassionate. They're very um, intense sometimes. Um, and that, that those are some of the very, the few traits that gifted children share across, uh, across areas, across uh, their, their different uh, backgrounds. But I think with black gifted children, oftentimes we are overlooking the fact that these children do share because of our historical background. Um, the, we, these children do share uh, also some verbal gifts that we don't always pay attention to in the classroom. Uh, they are um, the ones who can use words in different ways and enjoy doing that. Um, they are great orators or they are great at speech making if you give them the opportunity. Um, these kids are really good at um, exploring and using words in competition, like in debate. They are very, very good at that. Uh, these children are also very creative. Uh, they do tend to explore, to excel, excuse me, in the arts uh, and all the fine arts areas. They, um, they are also uh, good at problem solving. Uh, particularly when problems are, are shared with them that are relevant to themselves and their community. 
uh, again, they do have a deep compassion for uh, for their own community, for humankind. And again, if we expose them and we have give them opportunities to share what their passions are, they will do that. They are very, very good, I would say, in the area, in the STEM areas as well. It's hands-on, it's problem solving, it, it addresses their curiosity. Um, we, you know, again, so some of the traits they have may be different from other gifted children, but some may be very much the same as other gifted children. So we don't want to, um, we want to focus attention on what they do that's different, but we also want to say to educators that if you were to look at black children, in the same ways that you look at majority culture children or white children or affluent children as being able to share what their gifts are rather than looking at them for what they can't do. You know, that deficit-based approach that we've used for so long, it, you know, that, that, that time is over. We, you, we really need to begin looking at all of our students for what they bring to the classroom. What they what they bring, what kind of what kind of heart they bring, you know, what kind of skill sets they bring. What are they bringing into the classroom that because they happen to be packaged uh, as as black or brown or happen to be poor, we're not paying as much attention to them as we do to those other students. So, you know, it's um, as my mom would say, it's six on one side and half a dozen on the other. We really have to look at who these children are and what they what they offer to us, you know, in, in the classroom. I have had episodes on the podcast in the, the past few years about the way that Black children are underdiagnosed or late diagnosed with autism, ADHD. I actually just interviewed uh, a behavioral optometrist about visual problems and the way that Black children are often not or under they're underdiagnosed with farsightedness issues that can then be misdiagnosed as either ADHD or behavioral problems. And and so I know the same goes with gifted children, that there are a lot of roadblocks in black and brown children being identified as gifted. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you see as the biggest, you know, what's really getting in the way of that? Okay. So I want to capture, and, and I know we hear this and we, we talk about this a lot uh, across education now, but I want to capture all of what I'm about to say <laughs> and what, what, is, what is called structural racism. You know, we, you know, the way schools are set up, the way that schools have been set up in this, in this nation over time have, have not been to favor black children. It's not been around who they are and what, again, what they bring to the classroom. So because we don't have teachers who are properly trained to look at their cultural strengths, to look at their cultural legacy, we teachers who don't know how to communicate with these children. And, and we know that at this point in our schools, most of our schools across the country, the majority of classroom teachers are white middle-class females. And so if they haven't had the background, they don't have the understandings of what it means to be black and, you know, what it means to express yourself in, you know, if within our own communities, then these teachers need specifically need training in culturally responsive teaching. We have to absolutely make sure that every teacher that faces children who are different than them different in terms of cultural background, racial background, uh, that language background, that they have training so that they can meet these children where they are. And then they can perhaps uh, begin to see the strengths and the gifts that these children bring into the classroom. So classroom teacher training is critical. The, the, um, the lack of engagement, Deb, that we have with Black families across the country in most schools, not all, but many schools, are not engaging Black families in a positive way. They're just not doing it. Um, they're not um, looking at, once again, you know, wh wh what is it about being a Black family and a Black community member that makes us different than the, than the traditional or the, you know, the, 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 the broader majority culture families? What is it different? What, you know, what do we bring into all of this? You know, how do we raise our children perhaps differently? How do we um, bring into our, our households what our legacy is? And, and why is it that uh, we say to families, to our children, that they have to work twice as hard in order to to be seen in order to be recognized, you know. So in order for schools to understand that, they have to engage with Black families in a respectful way. 
to understand the traditions, the values, the norms, bring Black families in. I can't tell you how many times I have done workshops over the years in school districts, uh, evening time workshops, the school districts set up when they bring me in, you know, to do PD for their teachers. In the evenings, uh, oftentimes we would we would have, we would do two things in one day. The evening time, I would meet with families. And I cannot tell you how many times I've met with families uh, from large school districts, urban area, from rural, from the eastern part of the United States to the west, to the to 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 the to, to southwest, all the way out to California, uh, in New Jersey, uh, um, in Milwaukee. I've met with families all over the country, black families here who, once my workshop session is over, where I'm talking to them about their gifted children and how they can advocate, what they can do to support their children at home, many of them will come up to me afterwards and say, Dr. Davis, it's, it felt like you were in my house, that you were in my living room, that you were right with me while I was raising this kid. But if you hadn't come tonight, I would not have known about this. Now, t- you know, given the school district did invite me in, so it was at their prompting that I was there. But the fact that uh, these parents have had high school kids, um, you know, kids that are in elementary and middle school in the school district for a period of time. And before they invited me in, these families didn't know about the gifted program. So, so you know, we, we are not even reaching out. We're not even getting the information out into these communities. So that's one of my biggest you know, my biggest recommendation is that school districts work harder to get information about gifted services and AP, you know, you know, advanced learner programming, enrichment programming, everything they offer in these public school settings needs to be made available and disseminated to all communities to all communities. And then, you know, to make we need to make sure that those communities have access and also invite them to the table. You know, I know that sounds cliche, but invite them to the advisory council. There shouldn't be an advisory council for gifted education anywhere in this country that is not demographically representative, that is not demographically representative. But I did, I will tell you that if we were to to take a poll right now in any state, in, in pretty much any state, to ask them about demographic representation on gifted advisory councils, you, you we would not see what we want to see and what we need to see. So demographic representation is critical. It's critical. You can't you can't sh- say we're going to set up a new program or we're going to expand our services without making sure that the very parents and community leaders, uh, the faith leaders, even from those communities, sorority, fraternity. You know, there are lots of people in these communities who can come in and advise school districts on how better to serve their children, their children. We're not bringing them to the table. And that's very, very important for us, Deb. Um, I could spend I could spend the next three hours telling you different ways that we can go about doing that. But it's absolutely important that families, these families that we're targeting for, you know, for, for changing our gifted program services, for making them more exclu- inclusive, and you know, you know, making them more invitational, that we make sure that those people, those students, those families have a seat at the table. We'll be right back after this quick break. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. 
There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words, straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. And then the other thing to do, and then I'll kind of move on. I know you have a few other questions, but the other thing to do is oftentimes when we are setting up these kinds of uh, workshops and and uh, advisory council meetings or um, or parent training sessions, why not take some of that information out into the community and offer it at a community center? Why not? Why not do it in the evening? Of course, we're doing them in the evenings anyway, but why not do it on a Saturday morning? I worked with a school district uh, for a, a number of years, and eventually we were able to get our uh, get their parent sessions out into the community on a Saturday morning. Saturday morning, allow the families to bring the young children with them, set up a place for a uh, you know, room or two where the young children can be cared for with games or with books, you know, uh, bring some college students in to help you out. Make sure people have something to eat and get those parents clustered up together and talk to them about their gifted children. We have so much more we can do to ensure that there is equity, not just in, in in identifying students, but also equity in ensuring that we have stronger parent and school, com- school and community collaboration. If we want the school boards to listen to the need for expanding services, the people that can do that for us better than even the educators themselves would be those parents and communities community members. They come forward, oftentimes school board members, policymakers, people who do the funding, they'll listen. They will listen to those uh, individuals, sometimes more than they'll listen to us as educators. I think, I I hope I didn't go too far off of where you were asking me to talk about some of the barriers, some of the roadblocks, you know. No, it's very, you know, I can Again, hear your passion for just there's so much work to be done, but also you seem very positive and optimistic about that this is something we can do together, that there are so many different ways to tackle this problem. And that is really inspiring. As you were talking, I was thinking about for a lot of people really thinking about this idea of inequity and in gifted programs. I mean, it's certainly been in uh, in the news in certain school districts throughout the U.S. in the past maybe decade. There have been a lot of different approaches to what that looks like. But the podcast series, Nice White Parents, which I'm sure many of my listeners had listened to, which came out a few years ago, really highlighted the ways in which many public schools are essentially segregated and and how problematic many gifted programs are. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I, my son, Asher, I have a 17-year-old. We listen to that show together. We we live 
a few blocks from that school. And we're always, so we've had lots of conversations about that show and, and, and just what it kind of brought up for so many people. I'm wondering what you think from the point of view of gifted programs, full-time gifted programs, and, and what is inherently problematic. What do you see as the way to move forward with public schools to support all of their gifted students while addressing those racial disparities? The racial disparities, the segregation in gifted programs is real. We know that. We know it's real. We can go into a majority, listen to this, we can go to a majority of low-income school or a school with the majority of black and, and brown students and go into the classroom if they have a pull-out or a pull-out program, go into the classroom where the gifted kids are and the gifted kids will likely, um, if there are any white kids in the district, they're more than likely to be, will be white kids and the, and the black and the brown kids don't get don't get selected for that program until we, you know, start looking at, once again, alternative methods for identifying students. We're going to continue to have these disparities pop up. They're going to, they're going to show up. They're going to be the name of gifted is still equated with elitism in this, in this country. I started, you know, this work a number of years ago and the biggest complaint that I heard, you know, uh, back in the eighties, uh, back in the eighties, the biggest complaint I heard was about gifted programs being elitist. And it just irritated me so much, not just because, uh, what that suggests is that the only kids who are gifted are white kids, the only kids who are gifted are kids whose parents, uh, have means, the affluent kids, the middle-class kids that irritated me. And so it's forced to say now what we're going to do in order to make sure that we have more equity in gifted programs. We're going to eliminate the programs. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense at all, because what that suggests is that uh, kids of color, black kids, brown kids, even poor kids can't be gifted. And that's a that's a slap in the face. That's that's absolutely a slap in the face. It's a very to me, it's a very shrewd way, very shrewd way of reorganizing programming you know, in, in schools, making it available. They're going to change the names of it perhaps, but, but, you know, students whose parents have means affluent student, affluent parents will always get what they want out of public schools. If they want to stay in public schools, going to always get what they want because they have the means. They're the power players. You know, they're the power players. They're the ones who can call up a school board member, um, uh, an administrator, superintendent, they'll be in their face to make sure they get what they want for their kids. These programs, who these places where they're saying they're going to eliminate programs altogether, they're going to have a fight on their hands from those parents, and those parents will win. And that's really sad. They're going to win, but so they still won't have addressed the issue of how do we more fairly <laughs> identify and recognize the gifts of children of color, of black kids? How do we recognize and how do we serve them in our publicly funded schools? These are public schools. All kids who walk in the door should be served based upon what their needs are. There are, there are a bunch of bright black kids that go to Title I schools. That, and Title I, you, as you know, the schools where, where um, the majority of the students are, um, are low income. There are a bunch of bright kids that go to those schools whose teachers and whose principals sometimes want to advocate, but if they don't have the resources, they can't. And then there are teachers in those schools who say there ain't no gifted kids here. I've had a teacher actually say that to me, Deb, in my face in the Title I school. I don't know why you're here. Ain't no gifted kids in this school. I don't know why you're here. And 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 she she meant that in general that because she was in a Title One school and these co kids come in once again with all kinds of challenges because of uh, the, the 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 you know poverty circumstances and the situation they have to live in and live under. Um, they come in and and this kind of a teacher exists everywhere because again they're not looking for the sparks of intelligence. They're not, they're not looking for the creativity. They're not even going to teach to bring out, bring the creativity out in these kids. They're going to stay on the lower level of blue taxonomy. They'll never get this, you know, to synthesis and evaluation and create, you know, they'll never get there because they don't believe in these children. They don't believe in them. So no, we're not, we, you know, I would, I would not ever say to anyone and I have, uh, written about this, and I'm actually presenting about this at the National Association for Gifted Children conference uh, coming up in November. 
I will never say that we should be eliminating gifted programs in order to create equity in our schools. What we should do is change the way that we identify students for gifted services, change the way teachers are trained, change the way we collaborate with families and with those parents of those students, change the way we, uh, you know, we do everything in the name of educating our brightest students. They are everywhere. I have been, you mentioned, you said around the world earlier when you introduced me, I have been around the world with this message. People invite me to come in and talk about the giftedness in their communities. Here I am, a, a Black female going to the Middle East, talking to them about the giftedness in their communities. What are we doing to identify those poor gifted kids? And they want to know what is the United States doing because they want, in these other countries, they want to make sure they develop the minds of all children, no matter where they come from. They, they're looking for giftedness everywhere. And we're, we're not quite there yet. We're not quite there. So we do have a lot of work to do. We can't, we can't um, afford to uh, support elimination of gifted programs. It, it just, it's just too contradictory to what it is that, that we know about the human condition. There are people in every community who have ideas and who have answers. We expose these kids to, to the, the you know, scientific methods and models and some of the, the great work that's going on at the university level and, and some of these STEM programs and all kinds of. I just read an article the other day about a young lady um, <laughs> who actually uh, had an idea that ended up going to NASA uh, around and that they, they used her idea for one of the uh, the rovers that 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 was traveling around, you know, in in space, and so a black girl, a young black girl. I read another article about a young black girl, 15 years old, who's about to become a grandmaster in chess. You know, so I, I I spend my nights collecting these articles and sharing them and framing them so that I can make sure that everybody understands that that um, being black and gifted is nothing new. It's nothing new. We we just have to do a better job of finding these kids. That's our responsibility. We have to find these kids and we have to ensure that we give them access to opportunities. What it is, is about the difference in access or not having access. And if they have access to opportunities, access to teachers who believe they have gifts, who believe in them, then there's there's some new things that are going to happen, but absolutely not, Deb. I, you know, I'm, I I will not support and cannot support elimination of programming uh, in the name of equity. There 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 are some things that are going on in some areas around the use of of uh, test preparation that I have a problem with. Because that test prep, this movement towards test prep to get into a, a gifted program is not what it ought to be. We should not be uh, we should not be allowing uh, individuals to sell test preparation services because when you when you attach uh, you know attach a, a dollar sign what that means is you're already creating a divide. Those parents who can afford it will access it. Their kids will have test prep. Their kids naturally will score higher on these same tests that other kids have to take with no test prep. That doesn't make any sense that we even allow that, that we even allow that. But it's being allowed. That's, it's being allowed. And it's been allowed for quite a while. And so test prep to get into gifted programs is what should be disallowed. That's, that's where the difference ought to be, that, um, that we should not allow that to happen in order for students to prove or demonstrate what their gifts are. There's other kinds of strategies that have been re well researched, and have uh, have 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 proven that we can do a better job. We can use universal screening so that students don't get, you know, don't get missed out on. We can use local norming in some cases to make sure that we can provide for the best and brightest within a particular, you know, school district. There are lots of ways that we can do better without eliminating program services altogether. It, it doesn't sound, you know, good to people. There's a lot of people who don't even like the use of the word gifted. There are lots of folks who don't even like the use of that term. 
So we, we we do. This is uh there's a lot going on in the field. Uh we we have to band together and uh decide how we're going to address and debate with those individuals who are suggesting to us that the way out of gifted services is in the, the way to eliminate inequity is to um is to just eliminate programming. That that's not going to work. That's not going. It's a, it's an insult. It's an insult because because I know I know children, poor children, poor black children, um, affluent black children who can't get into programs because of the way the programs are set up. But I also know that some of those same kids are brilliant. They're 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 bright, talented, and black, and young, gifted, and black, or whatever we're going to call them. But those kids are bright. They just need to have access, and we cannot. Shut, close programs down and then recreate that program into something else. That's what's going to happen. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast. Yeah, and dismantling those programs, I was just going to say, first of all, thank you for that that answer. I had so many little questions pop up as you were say as you were responding to that, but it's just such a fascinating, rich conversation. And you're right, we could talk about this for hours. But dismantling those programs feels very lazy. Like this is just hard. We're not, we're, you know, we don't want to do the work to really make these programs be equitable for for all students. So we're just going to get rid of it. And as you said, the affluent predominantly white families are going to find a way to get their children's needs met. And I, I want to hear before we say goodbye about your upcoming book, but one last question on this, knowing that, you know, the audience for this podcast is predominantly white parents. What role can white parents who are listening to this play in ensuring that gifted programs are inclusive and representative of black and brown children? Well, white parents can join us and be um, our allies in this fight. But but uh, I just uh, uh, re- released a, an article with uh, Dr. Donna Ford, our, our, one of our great leaders in this work, and uh, uh, Gil Whiting and James Moore uh, around uh, going beyond lip service. So we have to have white parents who are willing to be allies and to support equity in gifted programs and support changes that will happen in their school districts. Uh, They have to be the ones also who come to meetings and speak out loud and, you know, share uh, what, what, what they believe to be more equitable ways 
of going, you know, of getting into to get black children to have the opportunity to uh, to be viewed and to be, you know, have opportunities to be admitted to gifted programs as well. So we need white families as allies, like we need white educators. And, and we're seeing more of that happen. We're seeing school districts across the country who are saying we're going to change this because we believe in these kids and we're going to fight hard. We're going to use our funds. We're going to use our professional development funds to bring people in to train us. We're going to we're going to begin to purchase these great books that are out on the field now. Now, um, we, we're going to use these books as book studies to make sure our teachers understand and have a, you know, have a, a deeper, deeper level of understanding and commitment. And we also, um, you know, in some cases, we're also going to have to clean house because there will be people who who don't believe in uh, in black giftedness. They just just won't believe in it. Um, and we so in some school districts, when we know these people exist there, they, they need to find a job. And, and, and I can say this because I'm outside of a district. I, you know, I'm working as a consultant. I'm independent. They need to find a job doing something else. They, they we cannot have people on our teams who are anti-black. And they are. They are. So we we need the white teachers and white families. Uh, we need everybody to come to the fore to say, OK, we're going to work on this and we're going to work on this together until we begin to see a difference in our programs, in our school districts. And then we have something we can be proud of and we can share with others around the nation. Yes, they can become our allies, but it, it's not going to be easy work because they're going to be criticized by their own people. They, you know, it, you know, we are such a, a racially divided nation, uh, and and what we're seeing in gifted education is is an example of just how racially divided we are. And um, so, yes, we do have a place for allies. Um, and we want to make sure that those allies um, can come forward. They can join us um, as a, as a, those civil rights uh, organizations who say lock arms with us and uh, and work with us until we see a difference in the way gifted programs are being um, are being operated and being you know you know consistently held up in school districts. But we we have to have a different kind of a program and a different approach. And we need everybody to be a part uh, of this process. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like the conversation has changed a lot and that there is, again, mo- momentum around this. And I think that's a no small part due to the work that you're you're doing. And I love that you opened this conversation by saying that this isn't your reason for, for being here, you know, on this show, but this is really what you see as your reason for being. And it's just really inspiring. And, and I'm grateful that you're doing this work. You know, you do have a new book coming out called Empowering Underrepresented Gifted Students. Would you take just a, a few minutes and tell us about that? Yes, very excited. Uh, my colleague Deb Douglas and myself uh, were able to bring together a number of experts, scholar experts, and even students uh, in the field to talk about how we we can do better with equity by ensuring that these students have are empowered, that they have an opportunity to let educators know what their needs are, what their dreams are, what it is that they need in order to be successful. So we, what we did was we, we went after, um, or we, we, we vetted <laughs> some of the great names in the field who are working specifically on these particular areas, uh, African-American students, uh, Dr. Donna Ford, and her, some of her colleagues pulled together a powerful chapter uh, for for the um, twice exceptional uh, Megan Foley Nippon. She has a great chapter there. We 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 deal with the ESL population and um, the ELL population, excuse me, Latino population. So each of the population groups have an expert uh, in that chapter. Th- those chapters, uh, Dr. Jaime Cassiano and Dina Brules uh, wrote chapters for us. But each of the chapters uh, focus on a a student or two and how that student actually went through a process of uh, becoming empowered because they were were taught and encouraged to self-advocate 
self-taught and encourage the self-advocate. So we use uh, Deb Douglas's self-advocacy model. So I don't want to go into too many details around that. But um, we also were fortunate enough to have a group of students to write a chapter, uh, a group of students from a school for the gifted in uh, Florida, a group of multicultural students to write a chapter around self-advocacy for students and, you know, what it meant to them to be able to self-advocate in a particular way. And we have a powerful chapter there around parents. Uh, so we have, um, there were myself and two other colleagues, uh, Dr. Um, Aaron Floyd Aaron Floyd, and um, Dr. Mayo, Dr. Shona Mayo out of, uh, here out of Virginia. And we pulled together and we actually spoke to parents and parents gave us some feedback. We have about, I think, 25 tips for self-advocacy for parents of Black and uh, and Latino students. So uh, we're very, very excited about the potential that this book around empowerment, empowerment of these particular groups of students will have in the classroom and school programs across the country. Um, we Again, we, you know, we believe that if uh, students are allowed to speak up or given the tools they need to speak up and they have educators that listen, that listen to them, then we'll be able to reshape uh, the way we serve who these these groups who are typically underrepresented uh, in our school programs. So um, we're, again, very excited, uh, very pleased to have been able to work with Deb and also all these great authors. Uh, Duke is coming out very soon, just a few more days. And um uh, and you and educators can actually go online and pre-order if they like. Uh, it's it's published by Free Spirit Press, and we're very very excited about that. Yeah, of course. And and actually, listeners, we're recording this before the book is out, but it is out now as you're listening to this. So definitely check that out. It's Empowering Underrepresented Gifted Students. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes page. And also, Deb Douglas has been on the podcast before where we talked about her self-advocacy work. And that's episode 126, if people want to listen. And I will also have a link in the show notes page. So before we say goodbye, anywhere else that people can connect with you or anything you'd like to leave listeners with? You know, I actually also uh, just had a book released uh, uh, just a few weeks ago with uh, Matt Fugate, Wendy Barron, Cecilia Boswell around culturally responsive teaching and gifted education. So, uh, Deb, if you can share that with them as well. Again, what I said earlier that I, I fully believe in is that when teachers are trained appropriately with culturally responsive pedagogies, in gifted education, they can do a better job of meeting the needs of all of these students. And so, again, please uh, share with them culturally responsive teaching and gifted education. Matt Fugate is the lead co-editor. I'm, I'm fourth co-editor on it, but, but we, we we fully believe in uh, the work that, that was done through, for, through that book as well. And I'm working hard, Deb, trying to get a, a third... A second edition of Bright, Talented, and Black. My my publisher is, is going to get real frantic with me if I don't hurry up and get get my uh, my draft into her. But I am excited that we are working on um, second edition of Bright, Talented, and Black: A Guide for Families of African American Gifted Learners. So that's uh, yes, it's I'm busy, but it, it's worthwhile. All of it is, every bit of it. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like you are slowing down anytime soon. So that is awesome. Yes. Listeners, please go to the show notes page. I will have a lot of resources in there. Any names that came up, articles in this conversation, you can find them all on the show notes page. Joy, thank you so much. It is just such a pleasure to get to connect with you in this way. I saw you speak at saying, you know, years ago and um, have been just following your work for a long time. And I'm just honored that you came by today and, and thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. If you want to dig deeper into this episode, check out the show notes page. Every episode has a dedicated show notes page on my website where you can get links to all the resources we discussed, read a transcript, and even easily go back and listen to key takeaways by using the chapters feature on the podcast player. To get to the show notes page for this episode, just go to tiltparenting.com slash podcast and select this show. 
If you love this podcast and want to help cover the cost of its production, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. For as little as $2 a month, you can help cover the cost of the hosting platform for this show, my wonderful new editor and producer, Andrea, and more. It's so easy to sign up. Just go to patreon.com slash tilt parenting to learn more or click on the Patreon link on any show notes page. If you're into social media, you can follow Tilt Parenting at Tilt Parenting on Instagram and Twitter. Visit the Tilt Parenting page on Facebook or join my Facebook community called Tilt Together. Lastly, please help this podcast stay visible and easily found by subscribing and leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much. And that's all for this week. Stay safe, stay well, and take good care. And for more information, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Co., and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.